Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hey everyone, it's Jory Rose. I hope that you're doing well and have been staying healthy and safe given all the uprisings of social injustice and protest during the past week across our communities. In an effort to stand with Black Lives Matter, I pulled my podcast episode from airing last week on June 1st. It did not feel appropriate to be sharing my voice or promotion in any of my work or anybody else's, but rather to take this time to listen and to learn. I have learned so much in the past week, and one of my best resources I'd like to share with you is Brene Brown's podcast that aired on June 2nd with Ibram Kendi talking about how to be anti-racist. This is an ongoing lesson for us all to be learning as Americans, regardless of our race, how to extend more equality and justice and compassion for all beings. In now continuing with where we left off, I am re-airing the podcast with Jed Diamond. That's an amazing interview from our online summit, Surviving to Thriving, in which he talks about men and how the women in relationship with men can learn how to best be in relationship, but also for men, how to be a good man. Jed has written 16 books on masculinity, and he shares amazing wisdom with us in this episode. You can still register for our free online summit at survivingtothriving.site. We also paused the summit in an effort to be silent so we can create more space for listening and learning. We have one more week of the summit and all of the interviews are extended for their free availability as well. Again, I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you're staying safe and using this time to really dig deep so we can uncover the pieces of ourselves that keep perpetuating the challenges and issues that our society and our culture are facing. Enjoy today's episode, and as always, be well. I am so pleased to welcome Jed Diamond into the summit today. Jed, thank you so much for sharing time with us and for giving what I know is going to be really valuable information to all of the viewers today. Well, thanks, Jory. It's good to be with you. And Good to share uh, a little bit of my experience with your listeners and viewers. Yes, so please um, tell everyone about yourself. What has been the journey of your career and what has been some of the main focus in your work? Well, just briefly, uh, this all started for me with the birth of uh, our first son, uh, which was November 21st, 1969. And when I held him for the first time, I made a a vow that I would be a different kind of father than Mm -hmm. my father was able to be for me. And to do everything I could to create a world where fathers were fully involved with their families throughout their lives. And really my work, uh, which has included, uh, you know, writing 17 books, uh, counseling, training, teaching, has really been a personal uh, expression of that commitment that I made to my son and our family uh, just over 50 years ago now. Wow. You know what's amazing with that, Jed, is that it takes such awareness to even notice it's a possibility to show up differently from how we were raised. And so what was it in that awareness in that moment? Can you name specifically what was it you wanted to be different? What did that yeah. look like to you to be a different kind of dad? Sure. Well, the real briefly, my, my father's story was that, like many men, he grew up at a, an, a time where being a breadwinner was the defining part of what it meant to be a man and what it meant to be a successful father, husband, and in his profession, he was a writer and a uh, an actor in New York. Mm. And uh, when he came to California in the early uh, uh, 1940s and 50s to get into the emerging television industry, he was blacklisted. At that time, there was uh, you know a lot of fear about 
people who were left wing or communist leaning. Mm -hmm. And as many people know of that era, the, the many in Hollywood who were liberal yeah. were uh, eventually blacklisted by, you know, uh, McCarthy period. And he was sure. one of the, the writers who was blacklisted. And so he couldn't, couldn't make a living doing what he loved to do. And Eventually. So that whole definition of what made a good man was taken away from him. Exactly. And which is something just, you know, to point out what's relevant right now is so many people during this time right now are losing their jobs. So, yep, you know, exactly. within the midst of this pandemic, many people are facing this crisis of, wait, who am I without this role? Exactly. And even then, and as it ties in now, um, even though he, it wasn't his fault, you know, he, was part of what was going on in you know the larger community, the larger world. He still felt responsible. Somehow he should have been able to still do that. He wasn't able to. He had what was called a a nervous breakdown back then. Uh, mm -hmm. Took an overdose of drugs uh, wow. in an attempt to end his own life, and ended up in a mental hospital. And so for me, growing up uh, with that history. I felt like one, I needed to, to know how to make a good living, you know, or mm -hmm. be able to change the social conditions that made it difficult for men to both make a good living and do what they love to do. And then to be able to deal with the pressures and the stresses without the, you know, fairly, you know, difficult and challenging decision to let go and feel like you had no other option but to check out in order yeah. to 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 deal with the pain of that so all together with all of that was really what lay the foundation for me to one want to figure out how i could prevent it from happening to me mm -hmm. how can i keep from going down the route of my father and how I could help other families who, you know, who might suffer as I did from an absent father, from a mother who had to go out and work, and I was left alone a lot. So all of that both motivated me. And then by the time I had my first son to say what I said to him, yeah. and I've been uh, putting that into practice, hopefully in the ways that uh, I could ever since then. Yeah, so really a professional and personal journey overlapping. Indeed. And so in your research and over the years, what did you really begin to understand about men and masculinity and, you know, what are their socializations and how they've been raised to show up? Because again, right now, we're seeing, you know, so much shifts in our culture and we, we still know socialization of boys and girls are very different. And, you know, you and I talked a bit before we prepared for this interview and just, and we'll get to it even more, but with all that's going on in the world, it really feels like an opportunity to wake up, an exactly. opportunity to do things a little bit differently. But in order to do that, you got to recognize what was wrong. Exactly. And one of the things I, I, I learned in my family that has to do with the, the gender roles that we have is that I realized that the same demands that were placed on my father to do certain things and not do other things were the mirror image of the demands that were put on my mother and on women. So for instance, you know, back then it was a demand that men be the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And the reciprocal side is women were told that they should not go out and work, you mm -hmm. know, that they should be at home and take care of the children. And, you know, in the same way that men were, were demanded that they be strong and unemotional. And the reciprocal side of that was women demanded that they be more sensitive and that they not be intellectual in many ways. So, so the, the liberation, it was very clear to me, the liberation of women as the women's movement, you know, took off in the 1960s mm -hmm. and 70s. I realized that the, the same things that were restricting women from doing one side of the world were restricting yeah. men from the other. And so I really saw 
men's work and women's work as being part opposite sides sometimes or reciprocal sides of the same coin. And so I always felt an allegiance to, to be able to do men's work and free up men as something that would be helpful to women and sure. vice versa, women's work being able to free men up. Well, because we also know that so many of those descriptions of what it means to, quote, be the good man or good provider or good husband don't always translate into really effective relationship skills. Exactly. And, you know, the, it causes, and as a therapist, I see so much of this, right, where the men are doing what they've been raised to do, what they thought they're supposed to do, and why are you still unhappy, even though I'm providing all of this and allowing you to, if you, if the woman chooses to be home with the kids or, you know, of course, in so many areas now needing dual incomes, that's not always an option, but, you know, so there's this real chasm of, on the one hand, here's what I was told to be a good husband. And yet how come relationships still aren't working out? Well, exactly. And I think if you understand why they don't work out it is, it helps us understand where we are now and where we can go. So in a sense, they worked out very well if you mm -hmm. accepted each of you to be a half person. You mm -hmm. know, if, if, you know, like our screen is split here, if we accept, right. okay, women can do this, whatever's in that box, and men can do what's in this box, and that they don't overlap and they don't cross over, you know, you can, you know, live fairly, peacefully that way. But as soon as one side, you know, I think the women kind of led the way in this said, yeah. on the one hand, you know, this isn't enough for us. It's not enough to just be a homemaker. I want to at least be free to choose if I want to have a more expanded life, if I want to work and be at home. And I think that had led to, you know, a men's movement that has you know, emerged later that said, for men, we want to be able to be more fully in, in, engaged in what it means to be human, to be able to be feeling, to be able to cry, to be able to say, you go work and you do that well, I'll stay at home and watch the children or to mm -hmm. expand our roles to be full people. And I think we're still in the struggle of how do you do that? How do you, yeah. in fact, get past the old trainings that both women and men grew up with. You know, girls are right. made of sugar and spice and everything nice, and boys are made of snips and snails and puppy dogs' tails. You know, the, the nursery rhymes and yeah. the, the, the movies, though. all of that. It's you know, very created. pervasive. Oh, yeah. it is, and it's very built into us, and more so than we know. So when we're trying to have a, a loving marriage, Often these old roles restrict us, pull us down, cause us to conflict with each other and make it difficult to have, you know, the beautiful relationship that most of us want. Yeah. And the other challenge is there's not the role modeling of the previous generation to know what to emulate. Exactly. Yeah. So then we're stuck upon these ideologies that don't have a working model to use as a, a, a foundation or a reminder to let it even know that it's really possible. So then there's up against those challenges. Exactly right. And I think what it leads to is, uh, you know, many men that start feeling increasingly irritable and angry. You know, I talk about that in one of the things that gets in the way of good relationships when we feel frustrated, when we feel either who I am is not appreciated. You don't seem to you know, I can't do anything right. I hear that a lot from, from men. feels like no matter what I do, she's not satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's saying, you know, I just want to, to, to hear how you feel. I want to know what's going on inside you. Um, and often the feeling is from men, one, I don't know how to do that because part of yeah. male, I call it the man box culture, you know, the box that men are placed in, have been told, to keep our feelings closed, to be strong, stiff upper lip, don't complain, don't cry, man don't up. whine, don't, yeah. you know, man up, all of those things. And yet we know women want more from the, the men in their lives and men, you know, are wanting more from the women, but we didn't have the training, we didn't have 
the 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 skills and the 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 man box break and then what can replace it which is kind of what i've been trying to teach people and learn in my own life yeah it's such you know wonderful descriptions for what so many people are experiencing and i think the value uh, you know of, of of sharing all of this it lies so much in the normalization of people's experiences because I think without that normalization, we take it really personal and think, oh, it's just me. This is just right. my relationship. This is just my husband. This is just my wife or whichever way you're looking at it. Yeah. But when you can step back from the personalization and recognize it's a socio-cultural phenomenon based on a variety of factors exactly. that maybe at one point served each gender or sex, however you want to name it, and maybe at some point it's not working anymore. Exactly right. And, and I think it, it's not working in a number of ways. It, it's not working because just as women recognized that they were, they were increasingly unhappy. They, they yeah. didn't feel that they were fulfilled. My mother is a good example. You know, she, she was very good in the business world, but she was told, you, you can't do that. You need to stay mm -hmm. home and take care of the kids. She had her own woman box she was being exactly. put back into. And my, my father was really the more nurturing, the more gentle. And yet he was told, you have to get out there and work and you got to get a job. And if you can't do that, you're not a man. So I think increasingly what people are wanting is they want a whole life and they want a whole relationship. And yet we don't have any any tradition for that right. uh, we don't have training for that and so that's why you know the work that you know that you do and john does and that i do with my wife it's interesting just to you know give you a little snippet behind the scenes of, of our life uh, after i finished my my previous book on the father wound that looked mm -hmm. at what happens to men and women when we grow up <laughs> in a family where a father is absent physically or emotionally which is true for so many of us, I thought, well, this, I think, is the last book. It's 15 books. It seemed like a good good number yeah. to stop on. And my wife said, and she'd never said this before. She'd never told me I should write a book or I shouldn't. She was always very supportive. But, you know, that was my world. And she let me, you know, kind of yeah. do what felt right for me. But this time she said, you have to write another book. You mm -hmm. have to tell the deeper story of what's good about men. And mm. she said that so many men in her view, and we have sons and daughters and grandchildren of male and female, so in our family, we, we, we feel this directly. But she said, men have been so forced in our society to wear armoring that keeps us from being who we are. And she said, men need to, to be talked to and guided of how to break out of that, that straitjacket and that armoring. And yeah. women really need to understand what it means to be a good man. So mm -hmm. I, I, wrote, I wrote the book, and it's my latest book. It's called 12 Rules for Good Men. And mm -hmm. the reason it resonates so much, I think, for so many people is, it's a, she said, it needs to be prescriptive. You need to really tell men, here's what your experience has been. You've been doing this for yeah. 50 years. You, you've learned some things. You need to really share honestly and openly what's worked for you. And she said quite, quite honestly from her experience that part of the reason we've had as good a marriage for 40 years we've been together was wow. because I've been in a men's group that's been meeting regularly for 41 years. And joining a men's group is one of yeah. the 12 rules uh, for, you know, being the kind of man that I think most of us want, because it's in men's groups that we're able to really learn to be ourselves and learn to relate to our partners from a deep sense of security about what it means to be a man. And so many men never got that and don't know how to do it. Yeah, and probably wouldn't even know where to begin to find it, even if they did want to. Exactly. Well, and there's so many things that it makes me, you know, think about of, you know, a lot of people who come and work with me often are seeking tools for creating greater peace, greater awareness, getting off that autopilot, you know, that focus of foundation of mindfulness that I bring to my work. 
one of the questions that I often get is, so I want to make these changes in my life because I really need X, Y, and Z, fill in the blank of whatever people are, are really creating um, and needing change around. But my partner isn't supportive of it. My partner's not on that journey or that path with me. So what do I do if I'm really needing to make these changes, but my partner doesn't have the same desires? And I very lovingly and compassionately will joke and respond and say, I don't know, I got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't really, you know, speak from the place of authenticity other than if I was on the journey, I had to, had to stay on it. But, it, you know, it bears the question for the work that you do specifically in this awareness around men. It's very easy, I think, for many women to recognize, oh, my man needs to do some of these things. OK, all right, honey, I heard this this book by Jed Diamond on the 12 rules to be a good man. Here, read this. Some men might just even take offense that. That, that was being handed to them. So what could right. some advice be for maybe the women who are listening right now, how to gently approach this so their partner doesn't either get defensive or reactive? Because a big mm -hmm. piece of this is the ability to self-reflect and be self-aware to understand, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I am not giving you space for your emotions or getting reactive when you're asking how I'm feeling about something or not being as nurturing as what mm -hmm. your needs are. So what would be some ways that you could guide couples in that dance, which is yeah. such a delicate dance? It is. Well, I, I can, I can tell you uh, two, two things that you, do, you should not do. Okay. Um, let's start there. <laughs> don't do this. Don't do this. Uh, you, you said, you know, you tried some things, you got divorced. Uh, well, you know, I did it twice. So if you can, uh, if I, I took you back to my first marriage, you know, I, I did what I knew how to do, which was what either I learned from my parents to do, mm -hmm. or I tried to do the opposite of what they did. And, you know, that neither one right. of those worked. So I ended up getting divorced, and which is hard if you're a therapist. It's kind of uh, humiliating to think that, you know, I'm here to help others to make their marriages work. I'm a marriage and family counselor, but my marriage yeah. falls apart. So I tried, you know, and thought, well, I picked the wrong person, found another person, and we eventually got married, and it didn't work out either. So this time, I thought, before I do it again, I'm going to learn not only what doesn't work. I thought I, I had a PhD and what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but to find out, in fact, what does work. So the first thing that I learned about how to find out what does work is to be able to accept that what you're doing is not working. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whatever the conflict is, there's a tendency that we all have, some to a lesser degree than others, to blame somebody. Somebody yeah. must be the cause of this. Some people have a tendency to blame themselves. You know, if something goes wrong, it's probably me. And well, and that can turn into a really deep shame spiral quickly for some yep, people. Yeah, it yep. absolutely can. Or the other is if something goes wrong, it's probably you and you're the cause of that. So that's just pure externalization. <laughs> exactly. And, and often, as you know, often the people who meet each other and get together have the opposite problem. You know, mm -hmm. you tend to blame me and I tend to blame myself. So it stays kind of locked in. So the first thing is to realize, you know, what I'm doing isn't working. The second is to realize, and this is hard and it speaks to your, your question is to say the only person I can change is me. Yep. That doesn't mean the other person isn't going to change. But when I do, just as you described, get a lot of women who read my mm -hmm. book and read The Irritable Male Syndrome or one of my other books and says, you know, I really need my husband to read this or I, you know, he needs help. What can I do to get him help? And I said, well, the, the thing that you can do is to get in touch with what part you're playing in this drama because everybody plays their part. And you know, Jed, I always say that, you know, when, when I work with clients, it, everything's a co-creation. Exactly, exactly right. And if you get that, then you find that we're in this together. Then 
you don't even get into the subtle, and we all do it anyway, but you are less into the subtle blame, you know, if only you would be different, then things would be better. Right. And, you know, I'll be honest, you know, men, uh, because our tendency is to act out our pain. You know, I, I, I wrote a whole book about the differences between male and female depression. And I say men tend to act it out through drinking, mm -hmm. drugs, anger, irritability, violence sometimes. And women tend to act it in through sadness and through eating and through, you know, in, ingestion. Yeah. So, so what, what I tell people is that whatever, whatever our way of, you know, either externalizing or internalizing, we need to recognize that we're all in this together. Nobody, you know, is to blame. Nobody is the cause of the problem. We've all gotten caught up in a cycle that usually has been going on through years and years and years, sometimes generations and generations where it's gotten yeah. passed on through the family line. And that we want, you know, that what we have in common, men and women who come into my practice, are we want it to be better for everybody. We want well, to feel better for you. I want you to feel better. I want me to feel better. And let's work together to make that happen. Well, and I think this is a really powerful point of recognizing we're on the same team. Right, exactly. And it's not easy. It's easy to talk about. I mean, let's, let's right. face it. We all, you said, are we on the same team? Yeah, we're on the same team. But when we're in the middle of a fight or we're in the middle of a disagreement or in our present case, when we're locked together at home because there's a virus out there that could kill us, particularly if we're in an older age group like I am, uh, or we're male, or we have, yeah. you know, illnesses or chronic, you know, lung problems, whatever things many of us have. And so we're, we're in a sense forced to be together. And there's really two outcomes, only two outcomes that I see with us at this time. Either we're going to use this time to heal old wounds and make our relationship better, mm -hmm. or we're going to use this time to try to deny what's going on, and the relationship is going to get worse, and we're going to come out of this with more pain, more hostility, more discomfort, more distance between us. Yeah. So the good news about this is uh, we're, we're, in a sense, forced to look at ourselves to reflect on our lives, to be able to see how are things going for me, yeah. for my relationship, and we talk about the transformation that's possible. Yeah. And this, I mean, I've, I've been doing this real actively for the last four, five, six weeks to really go deeper. And my wife has been doing that. And it's not easy. You know, it can be it's painful, but it's so worth it if we can have the courage yeah. to do that. And, and what you just said is, is to have the courage to do that because it does take a lot of courage. It's very vulnerable, yeah. Act. Yeah. you know, and, and you and I are very aligned in our thinking around this. And one of the things that I've been saying, and in fact, I've been writing about this as well, is specifically in our relationships, whatever was under a, what I'm calling a flashlight of awareness is now under a floodlight of awareness. Right. That we might have been able to perhaps even skillfully not pay enough attention to have to do anything about some of the challenges we were facing. We, you know, were able to get by because we were so busy, because we had our work and our kids and our social activities and, you know, whatever extracurricular parts of our lives that took us out of the home. And in the absence of all of that, nothing left to hide behind, nothing left right. to, you know, you can't really push it under the rug. And as I have always said, you know, if you continue to push the things under the rug, you're eventually going to trip over the pile under the rug. Exactly. And so, you know, now that everything that might have been just getting by under the radar, now I really believe it's like, okay, guys, you have nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. So what are you going to do about this? Exactly right. And yeah. for some people, I think yeah. that's really, really scary because 
they don't necessarily want to face what's now under this massive awareness. And one of the things that it made me think when you were talking, and which I wholeheartedly agree, is it does require both partners to have a growth mindset. You know, John and I lead couples workshops, and that's one of the questions we often get is, how do I know if this relationship is really worth saving? How do I really know to, you know, keep powering through the pain and the effort and all of the challenges to, to work through it? And at the root, we often, you know, talk about you both got to have a growth mindset and believe that growth and change is not only possible, but it's what you work towards. Right. To some people, and I, I know a handful of them are very comfortable saying, this is me, love me for me. I don't want to change. That's your problem. Well, and I think the, the reason for that is that so many of us fear that change is going to take us backwards into old experiences, old family wounds that are going to make our lives worse, or change is going to take me into a place where I'm most vulnerable and most able to be hurt. And so yeah. we don't often do that voluntarily. I mean, it's great if we can have that kind of growth mentality, but I think for most people, and you know, it's certainly true for me and a lot of you know, my life, earlier in my, my life, the only way that I could push through some of the resistance is there had to be some kind of crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think there's two things that are going on right now in the time that we're living in. One is the, the crisis of both a, a worldwide pandemic that reminds us that we're all in this together. You know, mm -hmm. it's touching everybody on the planet. No one is immune from this. <laughs> Nobody's immune from it. And the second part is because the only way that we can stop the spread of this, this potentially deadly virus is to be able to keep distant physically from potential people that could spread the virus. So that means right. we're, we're all of us to some period of time and depending on where you are in the world, it's a lesser or a greater degree of how long you're, you're at home. But everybody is forced to be at home with themselves. So your routines are broken. Yeah. Your, your work has changed. Your family relationships have changed. Uh, many people are with their children, you know, much more than they've seven. ever been with their yeah. children. If you have small children or, or any children. You're going to be with them. And so what it, what it forces us to do is to reevaluate everything about who we are and our relationship. It's, it's the thing that says you, you have to do it if yeah. you have no choice. And the good news is that in order to survive and thrive, in order to not just get through this alive, but to get through this in a way that says, I'm, I'm better off coming out of this than I went going into it, yeah. means two things. One, we have to be able to do this relationship work because everybody's forced into relationship at home. Yeah. If, you're, if you're home, if you don't have any relationship, you're home with yourself and all the inner relationships that are inside you. If well, you're I'm home with somebody you're going to have to deal with the relationships with your spouse, with your children. So relationship healing is the required name of this time and this game. And that's what we're all of necessity having to yeah. do. It's, it, it's such powerful work. And you're right. Everyone is in relationship healing right now. And I love that you named even if it's just relationship to yourself. Yeah. And because we know that that often is the root of most relationship healings with our partners is to heal those points in ourself in which yeah. we are still wounded. So we don't act those out in our relationships or keep them as triggers and wounds in the relationships. And, you know, I'm finding for so many, the challenge is all of the ways that they've either in a healthy way 
or in what we might define as an unhealthy way, defended against being with themselves, have been stripped away. Right. You know, stopping at the bar on your way home from work, going to the gym, going for a girl's night out, going to Taco yeah. Tuesday, going to a sporting event, going to a concert, traveling, like all the things to distract from being with what is right. internally or in your immediate, you know, um, dynamics. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've, I'm sure I'll say this many times throughout this summit, but I know it's something you and I have spoken about and agree with that. This is, to me, the universe saying, all right, I, it's time to practice some mindfulness right now. Yeah. Because something in our lives and our world wasn't working. And what a great opportunity yeah. to be able to heal. Because look, I mean, and, and it trickles out and it's not just my personal healing or my relationship healing, but that's now going to role model to my children. So they're going to get that. It's going to trickle out into the world and look at what we're already seeing in global climate change. It, the beautiful, exactly. you know, beautiful side effects of us making well, some exactly. changes. I mean, you you really hit it on the nose is that there's a requirement that we do the internal and relationship change at home. That's part of what this is teaching us. The second part is that we really are in a new world. You know, I tell people that there, there are four questions we need to ask and get answered in our lifetimes, I believe. One, did I live a fully authentic life? Mm. Did I be the best me I could be? Secondly, did I love deeply and well? Did I really mm. learn to love myself and love my partner, my children, my family. The third is, did I really fully engage the major issues of the day, of the times in which I live? Mm. And fourth, did I really make a positive difference in the world? Did I fulfill yeah. my calling of what I'm here to do? And I think the, the, the COVID virus is one reminding us that this is the first time in human history that everybody in the world has been fully engaged in the major issue of our times. Yeah. There's no other issue you can think of that may have been an important issue, civil rights yeah. or the women's movement or what have you, that the whole world was involved with at the same time altogether. Yeah. And the second thing which you, you touch on is that we are in a whole new world now. We will never go back to the old world. And what it is teaching us, I think, and I think you, you, you hit on it, is that the world in which we were living was not working in significant ways, not just personally, but in our relationships and our relationship to the earth. We were yeah. out of balance with the natural world. And that this will either teach us that all those things many of us talked about, we need to get our climate in better shape. You know, we found out, you know, if you quit putting stuff into the air and burning fossil fuels, you really can clean things up. We're learning. And look that what it, we're learning. You actually don't need to go to the office to get your work done. For exactly many right. And you don't need to get on airplanes in order to talk to people at, in other parts of the world. So if we're smart, and a lot of people, I think, are, will be smart enough to figure yeah. out a, a vaccine, I'm sure, at some point. And I hope we'll be smart enough to be able to figure out that we can change the world to, in fact, create what my colleague Charles Eisenstein talked about as the mo more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Yeah. And I really love that because I think we all know there's a better world for everybody, not just the few. And that this is an opportunity for us to clean up our relationships and transform them and clean up our relationship to the world so that yeah. we finally, humans, get back in balance, which we have been for most of the two million years humans have been here. And it's yeah. only been, I say only, but relatively short. 6,000 years of human history of what we call civilization or some other people, yeah. Dan Eisler calls the dominator culture, that we really can return to the partnership, you know, not only with each other, but the partnership with the planet that really is the cornerstone of what it means to live on planet Earth in a relationship, 
of equality and connection yeah. and love that we all really hunger for and want. Everyone craves that. Yeah. And, and it makes me also, you know, it's forcing people into recognizing the impermanence of, of everything mm -hmm. and how easily um, we, we get too comfortable. I remember when my daughters were babies, my mom used to say to me, as soon as you get into a routine, it's going to change. So don't enjoy this schedule too much, whether it was a napping schedule or a sleep schedule. And she was always right. And I was always frustrated. I thought that she was always so right. Cause you know, when I would get them into a really good schedule, it's like, okay, I don't want it to change. I don't want it to change, but it's when we can be open to the change, it's not so scary. It's when we're resistant right. to it that we struggle more. And so perhaps through, this summit, one of the things people can really realize is how can I embrace this change that I'm being forced upon? Because I do have a choice in how I respond to it. But there's actually a lot of beauty in the changes to be had. And that yeah. the more people keep saying, and you even said it a moment ago, and I'm sure people interpret it as a negative of the world we knew is gone, right? We're never going back. And how could we? It's in the past. We never went backwards to begin with. So why would we think we'd go backwards now? And why does that have to be a bad thing? Right. And so exactly. again, to me, it comes down to a lot of mindset and to how can we embrace growth? Just because it's yeah. different doesn't mean it's bad. It's just yeah, different. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. And, and I think our relationships you know, so now we add this third layer of we have relationship to self of healing, our relationship with our partners and our children, and then our relationship to the earth and communities. And right. through all of these tools, yeah, we, we can definitely grow through this adversity right now. Exactly. Yeah, I think we've got a, a huge, wonderful opportunity to really transform everything. And that we're really being called on. I think those who are, uh, you know, I, I think of the the transformation that happens between the caterpillar and the butterfly. Yes. You know, and from the caterpillar's point of view, you know, everything is falling apart. Their whole world is world falling is apart. World is ended, yeah. Cells are dying. Everything seems to be, you know, darkness and, and horror. And yet out of that, you know, there are imaginal cells in that, being that then transform and create then a whole new, you know, light being that, you know, turns into a butterfly. And so, I think that we all are, you know, the potential imaginal cells that now have an opportunity to either die off if we, yeah. you know, are not able or not willing to have the courage to make the transformation or to be able to reorganize, you know, the caterpillar and the butterfly have the exact same DNA. So, you know, the, the whole organizing mm -hmm. principle that made one kind of being can be available to make a transformed being that can take yeah. us to the next stage of our evolution. So we just need to really calm everyone down and say, hey guys, we're just in the chrysalis right now. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Our wings will emerge. We'll fly again. It's all good. <laughs> well, it is if we make it so. I mean, that's yeah. the difference in the analogy. Yeah. We, it won't happen automatically. It will happen to the degree that our intention and our willingness to say we need to transform. We need to heal. You know, it isn't, you know, we could go back to business as usual if you want to, in a sense, stay earthbound caterpillar like and ultimately yeah. not in balance with the natural world as humans have gotten out of balance or we can choose to make the transformation and it starts in a sense at home because that's where we live right. and, and it that's, starts, where, and that's where you, we're stuck right now so exactly. let's meet ourselves so can, where we're at yeah can you really start with yourself because that's who you need to start with can you then use the self to help the partner that you're with or the relationship that you're with to transform and then can together, you know, the power of two or the power of our relationships then come together to transform our relationship to the, the entire world. Yeah, 
It's beautiful, Jed. I think there's so much value that has come from this conversation. How can people find you? And in addition to that, I know that you're so generous to offer a free gift. So if you could just explain to everyone what it is, the free gift that you're offering, and then sure. how can they best find you and um, you learn more sure. about you and your work? Sure. Let me let me talk about the free gift first. I, I mentioned uh, the, the book that I wrote that my wife challenged me to write, 12 Rules for Good Men, um, that really lays out a very specific 12 rules. Here are the things that you know men need to do, uh, starting with join a men's group. Secondly, learn how to break out of the man box, and then 10 other rules that I guide you through how to do. Uh, I realized that to really create that book, there were certain foundational principles that you really need to understand about what it means to be a man, what it means to be male. And the first thing that I looked for was when did maleness start? When were there males and females? And I realized when, you know, my degree in biology and my search back through evolutionary history, that maleness and femaleness actually is a billion years old. Wow. But the first cells that came were not male or female. They just split in two and you had two sister cells. Well, a billion years ago, you had cells that could not just split into two to reproduce. They needed to find each other and, you know, cellular sex occur. <laughs> and then we've had males and females for a billion years. So it's very ancient. So what my gift is to people is the foundational principles for the book I put into a, a very in-depth booklet that's called The Good Men Manifesto mm. that looks at 23 core aspects of what is underlying what it means to be male that can really help you with, I think, 100 uh, references and and resources wow. that people can tap into to see where I got the information and for further reading. So if you would like a copy of the Good Men Manifesto that you will be able to click on a link to be able to come to my website, Wonderful. which is menalive.com. And that you can find my other work, my writings, and uh, you will be able to get the uh, Good Men Manifesto, which will... Uh, tell you a whole lot about how I've come to learn what I've learned and will continue to learn, hopefully in the next years to come. Beautiful, Jed, thank you so much for offering that to everybody. And I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I know there's gonna be so many different aspects that people are gonna be able to relate to. And ideally through all of this, use this as an opportunity to grow and to self-compassionately and with awareness look at themselves and the areas in which to emerge a little bit stronger, maybe a yeah. little bit more compassionate or a little bit more aware, a little bit more communicative and whatever that looks like for everyone. Um, so thank you again for your time and I wish you wellness to your extended family and of course thank to you. you and your wife. Thank you, Joy, very much. All right, so that was fantastic. Good. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick intro. Hey, Jed, thanks so much. What are your top three tips for how couples or how men or, you know, what are the top three things people can do right now to survive the pandemic? And we'll just kind of list a couple of things in mm -hmm. five to seven minutes and we'll just be done from there. Good. I'm good. Okay. Welcome back to the Surviving to Thriving Summit, How to Grow Through Adversity. Jed, thank you so much to share with us what are some top tips that people can do right now to survive the pandemic? Well, the first thing that we can do is to really start looking deeply at ourselves and what needs to be healed in each one of us. So for instance, for me, what I found was that the first really deep fear I had that was coming up was getting sick because I got sick early on during this and the fear of, oh, do I have the virus? And if I do, am I gonna die? Mm -hmm. And I realized that triggered feelings and fears that I had all the back, way back to my childhood. The fear of dying, the fear of losing loved ones. So the first thing we can do and almost are forced to do if we're willing to do it is mm -hmm. to 
realize where are our anxieties, fears, what are they eliciting that may be places where we need to heal. So that's the first tip I, I would that. say. Use that to go deeper. Use it to be able to heal yourself. The second tip that, that I offer is that this is an opportunity to be able to communicate with your partner, if you're in a partnership relationship, or with yourself, because we, even if you're alone, yeah. there's, you know, people in you. There's, there's a lot of, of dialogue happening in a, internally. <laughs> exactly. So it's an opportunity to be able to be vulnerable and to share, you know, what's alive for me and how can I be supportive of what's alive for you? What are you afraid of? What are you dealing with? Let me tell you things that this is eliciting for me. So I know my wife and I have spent a lot of time talking deeply to each other. So that's the second tip that, I, that I'd that. offer is that really take the time because you're going to be under pressure. You're going to bring up things. You're going to trigger. I'll, I'll give you an example. My wife, we start playing Scrabble because we never yeah. had time for that. We're playing Scrabble. And the way I play Scrabble is I just want to get it, 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 whatever word I can find, I want to get it out there. Great. Okay, your turn. My wife, on the other hand, takes her time. If she wants to get just the right thing, and it seemed like it was taking forever for her to play. Normally, not a big deal, but with the added pressure, I realized I was starting to get angry. And I felt like I wanted to take the board and throw it through the window. Yeah. You know, come on, play already. And I had to breathe. So that's part of the second. Yes. You, you take a breath. You go, wow, wow, where did that come from? And then to talk about what are what is this eliciting for you in your relationship world? Yeah. That's and I love the Scrabble tip. example because it's so simple, but it highlights some really deep things people are feeling. So right. It doesn't take a big trigger to highlight what we're, what we're going through. Exactly. All and right, and the, what's your third the, one? The third tip is that uh, we all can take the time to increase our health and improve mm -hmm. our health and, yeah. and up our immune system. So, for instance, I, I have lung problems, you know, and there's not a good time to have lung problems. No. So I've started in my walks, which I do every day because I'm home, is to walk up the hill behind our house, which is I never would do because, oh, man, it's if you can huff and puff. Well, I realized, you know, huffing and puffing probably is going to be good for my lungs. So yeah. I've been doing that. I've been actually talking to some doctors that I've been working with to increase my metabolism to my my change my diet i've lost uh, 12 pounds uh, wow. since i've been here we haven't been going out to eat as much i've been eating better i've been eating you know and noticing my my diet more i've been taking supplements that you know that were are going to increase and and improve my immune system so regardless of you know how long you're going to be here and maybe starting practices that you've always said you're going to lose some weight or you're going you to got the time now <laughs> more, or you are going to eat better or you are going to improve different things of your health well man this is you know so many of these diseases heart disease cancer diabetes you know overweight you know they kill us far down the road so it's hard to get really motivated but these are the things that will prevent you from getting sick from the COVID-19. Because yeah. here's the truth, 80% of the people who get it, it's going to be mild. It's not going yeah. to be a big deal. The 20%, it, it can be serious. And for 5%, it can send you to the hospital or kill you. So if you ever thought, as I was talking to my son, he's been trying to stop smoking for years. He said, this time I've got, you know, I'm motivated. This time got, I'm going to do it. We all got the wake up call we've needed for creating some lasting change. So and I love this, these tips. These are going to help you. You do these three things or any of the three, do them all if you can. Yeah. It's going to so improve your life. And believe me, it'll serve you for years and years into the future once we get through this. 
and we will all get through this. Thank you, Jed, so much for those wonderful tips and again for sharing your time and wisdom. Be well. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com.